Kia ora koutou, <coughs> me kare kia tātou, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai. E hi a ke ana te atakura, he teo, he huka, he hau hū, te hei, te mauri ora. Tēnā tātou katoa, no mai harimai ki tēnei hui ata. Welcome to our webinar this morning. Thank you so much for joining us to learn more about patient management software, about using computers in a way that can respect um, the self-determination and autonomy and identity of trans and non-binary people. Um, I will pass over to Joey to introduce more about our session today. Good morning. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, thanks to everyone who's joining us, whether this is watching it live, watching it as a recording. We know a lot of people share these around afterwards. We're always glad. However you got here today, we're so pleased that you are listening. As Moira said, this is going to be a webinar about the limitations of patient management software in a healthcare context. We're particularly aiming it at people working in the health system. And we're trying to talk about how you can work with those limits in a way that supports the self-determination and dignity of trans people. This is a webinar brought to you by the team at Tengako Kahukura, and we will all introduce ourselves more in a minute. And also our guest presenter today, Cassie with E. Ryla. And it's great to have you here with us, Cassie. Hold on a moment before I let you introduce yourself further. Tingako Kahukura is a rainbow and trans-led organization. We are doing systemic advocacy and community building work with and for trans, takatapui, intersex and rainbow communities and organizations. And today, this topic really connects to and builds on previous topics from last week and also from previous webinars last year about trans and intersex health. So in the sessions last week, we talked about the importance of patient-centered care, what informed consent means in trans healthcare in particular, um, respecting privacy, supporting self-determination, those kind of principles that can underpin our work. And today is about linking those principles into the particular area of patient management software. You can expect a mix of practical software workarounds, um, a bit of that, and a lot of discussion about really how we're gonna put those principles into practice. We'd love for you to be introducing yourself so that we know where you're working and we can then apply those principles more specifically to the areas of work that you might be in um, as live attendees. That's, that's really great for us if you want to intro yourself there. And Moira, is there anything else on a practical level before we move to more intros about Zoom housekeeping stuff you want to share? Yeah, thanks, Joey. Um... This is a Zoom webinar, so we can't see or hear you. So don't worry about um, what your what your camera is looking like. Um, but as Joey said, you can um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat, and um, we'll all be able to see what you what you share in there. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so please be mindful of that, and it will be freely available for you to watch afterwards, or for you to share with your colleagues or with anyone you know who might be interested in this topic. We very much encourage you to do that and to also have a um, check out our archive of webinars that we've run previously. Those are all on our website and they're all free to watch. Um, so feel free to check those out and share them around. Um, we're going to have a presentation shortly from Cassie and a chat amongst ourselves after that. And we'll also save some time at the end for questions um, and comments from the audience. So please um, don't wait until the end. If you have any thoughts or questions, feel free to either um, pop those in the chat box if you don't mind other people seeing them um, or otherwise you can use the Q&A function um, that has the option to be anonymous as well. We really appreciate your comments and questions. It helps us to um, understand your interest in the topic today. It helps us guide the conversation in directions that are useful for you as our audience. Um, and yeah, as Joey said, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat as well. It's always help for, helpful for us to know who's here with us. Um, Feel free to share anything about your role um, in relation to trans health or community work more broadly. Uh, the slides as well from today will be available on the website after this, um, awesome. along with resources and recording of this webinar. You'll also get um, an email about that tomorrow, along with an evaluation form. And um, we'd greatly appreciate you taking a couple minutes to fill that out as well. That really helps us to um, inform our future webinars and work in this area as well. I think that's all my housekeeping, yes. Joey. Back to you. Yes, awesome. All right, thanks. I love that people are introducing themselves in the chat. That's so great to see. 
Um, and remember, if you have a curly question and you want it to be anonymous, you can use the Q&A function, um, which I think Moira mentioned as well, but that's the chat is totally available to all of you. We have our colleague Jono in the chat um, and they will be doing a great job of collecting comments, reflections, questions, making sure we don't lose anybody's um, bits and pieces that they put in there. <laughs> Jono's waving in the chat. That's, it's really great that you can do that for us, Jono. We deeply appreciate it because when we're up here talking away, it's hard to always pay attention to what everyone else is saying in there. Um, Moira and Cassie, can we introduce ourselves? Moira first, then Cassie, then me. Um, something about the situ situating yourself in the context of trans health, as well as whatever other intro information you want to share. Handing over to Moira to do that first. Yeah, sure. Cool. Kia ora anō. Um, he uri tēnei no te rārua, ko ngai tūpotu ki Motukaraka te hapū, ko Moira Kauni tōku ingoa. Um, Moira, whakapapa to the Hokianga up north to te rārua, as well as to the other side of the world, to England, Scotland, Ireland and Orkney. Um, project lead at Tinga Kakahukura, so I work a lot with Joey and with Cassie with other hats on. Um, I also am involved with um, PATHA, the Professional Association for Trans Health, um, with their policy and advocacy work. So I'm not a doctor, um, have a bit of a public health background, so I'm interested in um, trans health and wellbeing and particularly mental health and suicide prevention from sort of that public health angle. Um, that's probably enough about me. Over to you, Cassie. Um, uh, my name is Cassie. I'm originally from Texas. I was born and raised there and uh, immigrated to New Zealand about seven years ago, I believe. Uh, to study public health and I went to the University of Otago to do a master's thesis uh, researching the positive experiences of transgender adults uh, engaging with primary care in this country and uh, that led me to do more trans health related research and rainbow health related research generally and um, I also sit on the executive for PATHA, the Professional Association for Transgender Health, Aotearoa, um, down here in Otipoti. Uh, so uh, kind of try to support work going on in community groups down here in the South Island and the Southern part of the South Island specifically. That's probably about it. Kia ora. Kia ora. So nice to have you here with us, Cassie. Um, so I'm Joey McDonald. I i the education lead at Te Ngāko Kahukura, and I've been working in the space of trans health, kind of broadly speaking, or trans and rainbow community development for a while, for 10, 15 years maybe. Um, I work with all, all of the people here today probably, um, and it's great that there will always be new people coming to attend our sessions as well. I'm a Pākehā person with ancestry back to Scotland on my dad's side, the McDonald's of Glencoe, and uh, mostly England on my mum's side, the Croft Croftons of Essex. I'm based out in West Auckland, Tamaki Makoto, um, on the whenua of Te Kawaro Amaki, and I am, it's a beautiful day here, and I'm really pleased to be getting into this topic. Um, I'm going to stop talking so that we can get into the topic. Did we all say our pronouns? My pronouns are they, them, uh, <laughs> Moira and Cassie's also. <laughs> I just did it for the group, don't worry about it. Um, last week, I was saying we did two webinars that are quite relevant to this topic. I think we already touched on one of the key themes, which is really being transparent about the limitations of the system that you're working with. We're imagining that we're talking uh, mostly to people working in healthcare who are directly engaging with patients and then taking notes or using a system, you know, a software system to record details about a person. And you will probably have ideas about your workarounds too. So please feel free to put those in the chat because we know different systems, uh, you know, newer or older systems are in place in different contexts of primary care, especially. And we would probably not have all the answers about all of those systems, but you might have things to share. So please feel free to share your reflections as well as your intros in that chat. 
I'm really looking forward to hearing more about organ inventories as well. We're going to talk about that. Some people asked some questions about that in the last webinar about trans health. And I was like, we don't have time. I'll talk about that next week. So we're going to get into that as well. Um, Cassie, it's really over to you and your slides whenever you are ready. Thank you so much. Cool. I'm going to screen share my slides. That should look good for everybody. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking today about some of the limitations that uh, clinicians and people who work in clinical spaces may face with the kind of um, digital infrastructure that folks are working with. Um, this is just a kind of a staple slide that I put at the beginning of all of my presentations. Um, I know everybody here is, uh, is aware of trans people, that they exist, uh, but it's really important to reiterate as often as possible that excuse me, transgender and non-binary populations uh, do have poor health outcomes, physical, mental health, et cetera, um, but it's not something inherent to being transgender or non-binary. It's really got to do with those determinants of health. Uh, folks in our communities are more likely to have insecure housing, uh, be underemployed, experience discrimination, et cetera, and so that has impacts on our health system. Um, sorry, on our, our experiences of health. Uh, and when it comes to the health system, which is where y'all clinicians are, are kind of living in that space, um, there's a lot of barriers to accessing healthcare systems. And so sometimes that's people's uh, experiences of mistreatment and it makes them hesitant to go back. Sometimes it's just anticipated mistreatment, just anticipating a negative experience in a clinical space is a barrier to care. Uh, and this impacts both routine care and trans-specific healthcare, uh, such as medical transition or gender affirming care. Um, so I'm gearing this towards providers, uh, and uh, Tengaka Kokura provides a lot of really amazing resources because they're another barrier to trans people getting appropriate care is there's not a lot of ways for clinicians to learn more, to upskill, uh, to be more confident and more competent in these areas. Um, so why we care about the limitations of software. Software systems are inherently very binary. Um, a lot of the systems that you will engage with will have drop down menus and you can only choose from those menus and it's really uh, limiting what it is you're able to do with that software. Um, this is going to cause a lack of autonomy over digital representation for patients and that can impact um, the way that they engage with the healthcare system and their likelihood to avoid coming in when they need help. Um, this is especially noticeable when it comes to patients who are maybe outside that male-female binary, uh, especially patients who may be of a cultural background or an indigenous background where their gender concept isn't going to be represented at all in any way. Uh, and so that's kind of like a compounding issue. It just makes it worse for certain people. Um, so yeah, again, if a patient is anticipating being misgendered or misnamed, they don't even have to have experienced this themselves. They hear about it from um, family members or friends. Uh, that could potentially be a barrier to care. The system not uh, accommodating non-binary identities uh, just mentioned. Uh, and this is going to be a really big issue, which we'll talk about more uh, when we don't have uh, male and female options uh, that are attached. Uh, all these male and female options are attached to gender specific recall or sex specific recall. And that's gonna be your cervical smears and screenings that are really, really essential but if someone doesn't have uh, the right letter associated with them, that's going to impact whether they get recalled or recalled inappropriately, and that's a whole mess. And so we're going to talk about that more. And I do want to acknowledge that sometimes there's not a good option, which is why this is about those workarounds. We're talking about ways that we can um, bridge over the gap and um, address this need the best that we can with the tools that we have currently and hope that it will be better in the future. Um, so some of the workarounds, um, overarching issues that we're trying to address here is just decreasing barriers to care and increasing trust. That's it. It's super simple. Um, I do want to reassure folks that a lot of the stuff is actually um, tools you already have. Uh, the training that you receive as a clinician uh, already teaches you that collaborative care is important, that building a rapport is important, that transparency is uh, part of building trust is important. So like you already have these skill sets, you're just applying them in a specific way, in a specific context. Um, empowering patients to make their own decisions. The informed consent model is our whole healthcare system. And then also it's best practice for trans healthcare. So it's like you already have this stuff at your disposal. It's just about making sure you're using it uh, in these contexts. So organ inventories is another tool that you can use to work around some of these software limitations. We're going to talk about that today. Um, we're going to talk about some of the software functions that exist. 
And that's where hopefully if people have other tricks and tips that they've been doing, we can hear about that in the comments. And so we can all kind of collaboratively build on this. Um, and obviously getting more training for all your clinical staff um, and administrative staff is always a great idea to improve patient engagement. Um, so just an overview of what organ inventories are. Um, we both in clinical spaces and non-clinical spaces, we use a lot of proxies. And so we'll say things like something, something women's health, and we're actually talking about cervical conditions, or we'll say something, something men's health, and we're actually talking about maybe certain risks around mental health or prostate exams. Like it's, it's quite a jump between those two things. And so it's kind of just getting back to those basics. It's really talking about um, what the actual organs are that are in question, what the actual conditions are that we're trying to uh, screen for or address. Um, organ inventories are really easy to build into things that you already are doing. Intake appointments and taking patient history is something that all clinicians feel very comfortable with, presumably and organ inventories are uh, something that you can just blend right into that seamlessly. Um, it's a great way if you are working with transgender and non-binary patients to get a snapshot of where people are and kind of how they're um, hoping that their medical transition or their gender affirming care may go, which can be very useful in our context here where there's long wait lists and um, referral processes. So this gives you an opportunity to get an idea about where a patient is um, at that moment and what you may need to do long longer term. Um, it's also useful for all patients, arguably. Um, so you could make it standard practice. You don't need to like know which one of your patients are transgender or non-binary and then apply the organ inventory just to them. Um, and when I show you the examples of um, the organ inventory I'm gonna talk about, you can kind of see why. Um, so this particular organ inventory, and this is just um, gonna be a quick overview of this document is by Dr. Antonia Dorsey, and uh, she's a transgender uh, clinician in the States. This is just one example. You can make your own, you can um, cobble together different versions, but this is hers. It's cited here and it's in the resources at the back of this um, PowerPoint. Um, so it has some questions at the beginning, kind of giving you some examples on how you might engage with a patient. Uh, what parts do you call your body is always a good way to start because lots of trans people have different words that they feel comfortable with and other words that make them feel a bit uncomfortable or kind of icky. Um, this is probably one of those situations where if you know a patient, you'll know how receptive they are to different kinds of um, questions and how to engage in this conversation. And if it's a new patient, you can kind of set the tone and just say, this is what we're doing and try to keep it simple and straightforward. As you can see from this example on the screen, um, these are all procedures that some people may have had, some people may not have had, and it really has nothing to do with being transgender. So this kind of shows how this is potentially a universal um, document. Uh, basically what it is, is understanding what organs a patient has. And so you can understand what it is that you need to potentially do for them. This is an example of um, uh, where you can put a patient term next to the common medical term. So if you have a patient who is very uncomfortable with the term breast, you can use the word chest instead, if that's what they prefer. Um, you can document whether they were born with it or have it now. These are Understanding whether a patient's had a hysterectomy with or without over removal is an essential thing you need to know regardless of whether they're trans. So it's really just taking the, the stuff that we already have and the stuff we already know and applying it to a new situation. This particular one also has a field for embodiment goal or notes in case a patient says, I do have this organ, but I don't want it. I would like to return it, or, you know, get rid of it at some point. Um, this particular version of an organ inventory has a reconstruction status separately, which is really helpful for uh, patients who may be immigrants. In this country, we have lots and lots of immigrants. Um, it's also helpful for patients who may have gone overseas to receive gender affirming care, which is relatively common um, in this country, or at least it was up until the pandemic started. I'm not sure how it's changed since then. Um, it has a very limited little bit here about intersex status. And uh, I think that there's a really good chapter that I can refer folks to about primary care support for intersex folks. There's also uh, intersex Aotearoa and all the resources that Te Ngakakahukura has created around that specifically. So don't panic if this seems a bit limited here, we have you. Um, and then the last little bit of this particular example of organ inventory, it has um, an embodiment goal uh, field. So you can specifically have a conversation with patients uh, around transgender specific needs uh, around medical transition stuff. Um, so 
I could talk about that forever, but I'm going to move on to the next section of this conversation, which is about addressing software limitations. Um, and so this, <clears throat> this presentation was kind of conceived of after a conversation um, with some clinicians in the path of listserv where we were discussing uh, the different workarounds people had to try to make sure that patients were recalled when they needed to be recalled for various screening, uh, but still be affirming to their gender and not have that kind of uh, digital dysphoria issue. Um, so some of these suggestions that we kind of cobbled together, uh, people talked about software like in DC having um, a gender field and a sex assigned field. So that seems like it's kind of the, the software creators are kind of getting up on things. They're, they're starting to improve. They've got a sex assigned option. So you can make sure that that um, male or female recall is associated, but still have the gender be correct for the patient. Uh, MedTech 32 has an all genders option that you can use. But if you're not using these kind of most recent versions of the software, uh, you may not have these options. And pretty much everyone we talked to um, said that setting alerts and medical, sorry, manual recalls were the best option if there wasn't a way to um, kind of compromise on making sure people get the recalls that they need, but also making sure that it's affirming for them. Um, I think the biggest point about this is that it, it, it needs to be collaborative. If uh, you have a software that limits your ability to affirm a patient's gender while also still making sure that they're uh, gonna be screened appropriately, uh, just disclose that. Uh, transgender people and non-binary patients, they're not gonna be surprised to hear that this system is not uh, built for them. And so by uh, being honest and saying like, there's a lot of limitations with this software and this is kind of the options that we have, uh, will actually, practically give you a pathway forward with the patient. You can decide what to do, whether to put them down as male or female or to do a manual recall or something else altogether. But by that, by doing that practical process, you're also building trust. And that's, that's part of that cycle of improving your relationship with the patient, which improves trust, which improves their likelihood to come back and seek care. And so it really is like lying a foundation um, to build a good relationship with a patient. It just, it can do so much. Um, let's see. So some things to be aware of when thinking not just about your engaging with the software um, in your practice and the patient in front of you, but kind of the, the rippling out um, effects of this. Um, when you're setting these manual screenings, you need to actually know what some patient's organ situation is. If you need to set a cervical recall for a patient who really needs to have an M down on their uh, account to make sure that they feel affirmed and are properly gendered when they come into the clinic, um, having that organ inventory, you'll know whether they have a cervix that needs to have a screening done. Um, there is on some of these systems an unknown option, which um, some doctors use it as kind of an intermediary between when you're transitioning from male to female or from female to male. Some doctors use it for intersex folks or non-binary patients. The problem is, is that can inherently be othering because it's not actually stating what the patient's gender is. It's you for unknown. Um, but the other issue is that these systems don't communicate really well with each other. So there are times where um, you may put a patient down as you to indicate that they're transgender. And then when they go to get their labs done and their blood drawn, um, that system will pop up an error message and say that there is a, a U and then an M or an F. And so that puts the lab tech in a position of choosing the right one, which is almost certainly going to be them looking at the patient, making some sort of judgment call about what they are, who they are, what their situation is, and then making that decision for them, which obviously no one's gonna enjoy that experience regardless of their trans status. But if you're collaborative about it, if you have that conversation with the patient, instead of just putting them down as a you, that means that the patient can anticipate that potentially happening and prepare themselves or opt out and be like, no, I don't wanna deal with that. Just put me down as an F or an M. And so by putting them in the situation of they're part of the conversation empowers them and it ensures the best possible outcome when there's not a lot of great options. Um, also note uh, that lab ranges are often tied to people's gender markers in the, the healthcare system and these software systems. And so if patients are going onto the app or onto uh, the patient portal 
and seeing their blood test results before you have a chance to talk with them about it, they may see that big red abnormal or out of range, um, which can be quite striking and, and startling for folks who don't know um, what's going on. So by talking to them and saying, if I put you down as M, then it's possible that your estrogen levels will be seen as abnormal or out of range when they're actually very appropriate for your uh, transition or for your needs as a trans person. So just, again, having that conversation um, and making sure they know that the providers need to interpret that information. Um, just a note, uh, GPs can update patients' um, NHI information. So that's their um, gender markers and their names. So if a patient comes to you asking how to do that, you absolutely can do that yourself. You don't need to worry about that at all. Um, I'm really excited we have so much time for questions, but just before I wrap up, um, I've got a little bit of an overview of some other resources. We talked about upskilling being a really important um, thing for clinicians and admins to, to do. Uh, gender minorities, Aotearoa, Patha, Tengaka, Kahukura, Intersex, Aotearoa all have a lot of really amazing online res resources for free. There's CME trainings going on, like the information's out there and we're trying to make sure that there's more of it and that it's uh, evidence-based and community informed and so on. Um, just the thing about best practice documents, uh, WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health has released um, Standards of Care 8, which is the newest version. Uh, it is available online. You can just Google it. Uh, and it does focus on informed consent as the gold standard for um, practice. We do have a document here that kind of bridges between that standards of care document and an Aotearoa context, which is the Guidelines for Gender Affirming Care, which has got this lovely um, PowerShell um, pattern on the screen here. And uh, hopefully we will be seeing an updated version really soon. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and organ inventories, I do have a link for the one that I used as an example on the last slide. And uh, thanks to the PATHA listserv for all the discussion that inspired this talk. And um, here's just a couple of little bits of um, references in case anybody needs it. And I think that is it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Very helpful. Great details there. And people were in the chat sharing their thoughts and questions as well at the time. And, and I think someone was talking about the Fenway guide, which I've also heard about as another resource. So we'll put the link to that on this webinar recording, like the page that has this recording and the slides and everything like that. Make sure that anything that gets mentioned that we think will be useful. We had another suggestion as well about a place that we might look into getting some resources from. So we'll check those out. And if we think they're good, we'll link to those as well. There's always so many, uh, so many more avenues that you could go down. But Cassie, I feel like you have covered some really key points for us. Um, and if anyone in the chat wants to discuss like or share tips or tricks about particular systems that you're using, or I know there's some discussion about in DC, and I don't know how to say that even, um, but, <laughs> but having a, a self-identifies gender option, but then we don't know what the implications of using that are, like what happens in the system. So if anyone knows what happens with that, feel free to pop that in the chat if that's information you have. I think the first question I have, and, and Moira, feel free to weigh in on this as well. Give Cassie a minute to like land after sharing so much information with us. Why do you think we're emphasizing collaborative care so much? Like what's the, why do we keep returning to that? And in a, what in a discussion that could be kind of technical, we keep returning to those kind of points. Thoughts on that? Um, I guess at a really principles-based kind of level, it's about um, supporting people to be self-determining and in charge of their own healthcare and their own kind of um, gender goals if, if they're coming to you for support around accessing gender-affirming healthcare, that people are their own, are the expert in their own experience and their own um, needs and wants around that stuff. And so um, being able to work with people in a way where you are giving them all the information and helping, like supporting them to make the decision, um, I guess is generally how we say yeah. that, how we're saying that healthcare providers should be operating in this way. 
Yeah, it's and understanding the implications of like, so I had an experience of going to a GP a few years ago, which I found quite useful where um, he showed me the screen that he, you know, the computer screen he was working on. And I don't remember what the software was, but you know, which I have M, F and U to choose from, which of those do you want me to choose? You know, and it was not in a panicked way, not in a like, I don't know what's going on and you're freaking me out. So can you just tell me what to do? Because nobody really wants that feeling. But it's also not the case that we need you to be perfect robot experts. Like we don't need you to say that it's going to be okay when it's actually going to be quite difficult. And you can say, I wish the system was different and we're working on updating this, but bear with me. Um, and I think that's the transparency that Cassie's talking about, right? And collaborative care and patient-centered care all feeds into that. And it really requires people to have done some amount of homework in a kind of self-reflective way to be able to feel calm and confident that even if you don't have the answers, you can interact with this person without making that their problem. And you can talk about what the limitations are really clearly without feeling defensive about that somehow being your fault. It's We know it's not your fault. Um, we're quite used to health systems not working for us. And we usually appreciate honesty about what those limitations are. I just think that key point is so important because um, I know the system is likely to keep changing. The various software systems are likely to keep changing and getting updated and lots of things um, across health and social services are changing and getting updated in a good direction, but I don't think it's ever going to be perfect. I think it's quite likely that we will always be needing to do some workarounds and some, you know, relational holding of that difficulty. So that is partly what we're asking you to do as a clinician, as somebody who's engaging with that system with us. Can I move to another question? i just say one thing Cassie, real quick. Go, go. just want to say something reassuring. Um, Competence leads to confidence with clinical work. And so if you are feeling those activated feelings, uh, negative feelings working with a patient, it's probably an indication that uh, you need to improve your competence so that you can be confident. Because uh, once we feel secure in, in our knowledge, it's much easier to engage with stuff in a calm, straightforward, uh, yeah. kind of grounded way. Um, yeah. And there's so much, we talked about this in the previous webinars last week, there's so much difficulty um, in terms of transphobic kind of public discourse happening here in New Zealand, definitely, but mostly influenced from overseas, really organized anti-trans hate groups. And so we know that there's a chance that you will be feeling more stressed as a healthcare provider to be asked to engage with anything to do with trans health if that's not something you've already felt competent and confident about. This is a hard time to be getting into it, but it is the absolute best time from our perspective to get more people on our page and to have more people be able to have our backs because we need that you know, more than we ever have before so mm -hmm. we appreciate you showing up to learn today or to do whatever you're doing will be making a difference for people can i connect that into collaborative <laughs> yeah. healthcare as well which is just just thinking that you know if you're trying to choose what option to pick for somebody um that often it's much higher stakes for that person than it is for you so for you it might be confusing or it might be frustrating that you haven't got it got the right option to tick or um you might kind of not feel confident but for yeah, for the person who you're supporting, it might be that um, there's issues of confidentiality or privacy, or if you're ticking an option that doesn't match the option that's on a different healthcare provider system, there might be issues of kind of safety or discrimination that um, they're being exposed to there. So I guess that's another um, reason to be thinking about good collaborative practice is just acknowledging that um, for the person who's coming to you, that there might be some of those issues going on as well around um, safety and privacy and who they're sharing their identity with and who they're not, um, sometimes for very good reasons. Mm, mm, mm. I also want us to talk about organ inventories a little bit more because I think the level of detail that you went into was so helpful, Cassie, in showing us an example. And I know there are lots of ways it could go, but that broke it down for me in a really useful way and also it relates back to that competence and confidence thing because I've definitely had clinicians ask me, well, how can I even talk about that level of detail of people's organs? 
like without being inappropriate somehow or invasive or like how can I do this in a non-pathologizing way and at, I would love to hear any thoughts on ways we can approach organ inventories that feel most respectful and and kind of clear first I'll just validate that to ask someone about their body parts can be potentially feel like it's reducing people to their bits and not seeing them as a whole person, which probably goes against a lot of the person-centered medicine that folks are learning um, in medical school. And so, yeah, first just validating that it's, it feels a bit weird to be like, do you have this part? Do you have that part? Um, but it, ultimately it's, it's a conversation and it's an opportunity to start building trust and building a relationship with someone. And like I said, if you already have a relationship with that patient, you may have a feel for how that conversation might need to go. Um, but if it's a new patient and you're doing uh, intake and history, it could just be one of those things that you fill out the form after having that conversation with the patient. It's not necessarily a checklist where you go, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? But instead saying, um, the usual stuff about history and major surgeries and um, just kind of exploring what people's health experiences have been up until the point that you came into their lives and then um, putting that down. And since we're talking about collaboration, if you are literally using the form, whether it be digital or physical, um, you can always fill it out and then ask the patient to double check it and make sure that they didn't, you know, there's nothing missing from it. And they go, oh yeah, I forgot I got my tonsils out or, oh yeah, I forgot that I got a scan. It turns out I only have one gonad. Like, you never know what kind of things people may have forgotten to try to pack themselves into this one conversation is quite hard for everybody. And it can be an ongoing conversation. It doesn't need to all happen uh, in that moment uh, completely 100%. <laughs> I was waiting to see if Moira unmuted. Take it away if you want to, Moira. Sure. Um, I guess um, talking a lot about workarounds with current systems and all these different software systems and different versions and what options they have. Um, I wonder, we had somebody asking about um, Tufatu order and the national health system and whether uh, what we know about the work that's going on to um, create any kind of national um, IT infrastructure around this stuff. Do we see a future where um, we don't need to work around because we have a national system that works well for everybody? <laughs> Yeah, so they're working on something called HERA, which is a centralized medical infrastructure, digital med medical infrastructure. Um, for I'm sure there's plenty of people in the audience who may know more about this if they're involved in the um, health informatics side of things. But um, theoretically, it could solve a lot of these problems because if they engage with uh, transgender and non-binary communities, if they engage with organizations like PATHA and are actually understanding what it is practically that patients and doctors are needing in those situations, it may be built in. So whenever they do release it, um, it but personally, I don't want to put all my eggs in that basket and just assume that it will all be taken care of. Like I want to keep working on what people are working with right now today. When you go into work tomorrow, which issues you're facing will impact lots and lots of patients between now, tomorrow, and whenever they get that off the ground. And I have no idea what the timeline is on that. I don't know if they know what the timeline is on that, but I can be cautiously hopeful, I think is the way I would put it. They are engaging with the community. I hope that they get all the right bits of information they need and factor that in, but I don't know when we'll see those changes directly. Mm, yeah, that's helpful, thank you. that's relevant. I think something I heard um, a while ago was that they're doing it in phases, right? So the first phase might help um, share information that's sort of easy to validate across systems like people's name or people's address and um, that more tricky things might come later. And I think they were looking at gender as one of the, the first things, um, <laughs> <laughs> hoping that that might hoping not be not complicated, tricky. but uh -huh, good luck. I, yeah, haven't been directly <laughs> part of those, those conversations. Yeah, yeah. We've, and we've still got more uh, questions coming through and I also wanted to highlight that um, I asked that question about Indeci as a software system and that having a gender self-identifies option for people to tick and what the implications are and somebody has offered some information about that which I just want to share with everyone in case that's relevant. Um, the 
the National Enrollment Service, it might cause an issue if you tick the self-identifiers option when it connects with the National Enrollment Service, there might be some kind of difficulty there because apparently at their end, it's quite limited. So we'll all be familiar with that it's kind of problem could happen as an implication. Um, also, in a, and I think this is helpful, if you select gender self-identifiers when someone's enrolling, probably the recalls that we've been talking about, like for screening recalls, might not auto-generate which is helpful as long as you remember to go through something like an organ inventory with someone and work out what kind of screening they do need. And then you can put input that into the system um, and hopefully set it up so that it's really tailored to meet the needs of that person and talk to them about it um, as Cassie has been encouraging us to do. So that's interesting about NDC in particular. And we also, I can also, oh, you Cassie, yep, share. I was just going to say, I'm really glad that these systems do have manual recalls because I imagine all of this would be just so much harder on everybody. Like, what are you going to do? Write it on a post-it note and stick it to the side of your monitor? Like, absurd. So I, I know it's not perfect, but I am really glad that those systems do generally have manual recalls and we yeah can absolutely take advantage of that, whether it be the note you mm -hmm. first see when you pull up a patient's file and put uses they, them pronouns, comma, non-binary, comma, genderqueer, just so you have that whenever you're engaging with a patient, that's the first thing you see, or whether that be having a, a thing that reminds you to contact a patient so they can get their cervical smear, even though they have uh, an M marker down. So yeah, not the best, but working with what we got, thank goodness for what, what we do have. Yeah, yeah. And thinking about privacy as well, again, because it's that I've, I've heard a lot of clinicians talk about um, is it flags or note, like it's a way of having a note that pops up when you're accessing a patient's information or file and that something like putting someone's pronouns in the flag, actually that might be really great because that will help you interact with that person. Certainly it'll be relevant to like preferred name as well. Usually systems have ways of negotiating preferred names because that's clearly not just a trans thing. Um, but pronouns you could put in that. Be mindful if you are making a little flag, a little notification that pops up for someone. Think about who else is going to see that. Um, because if a receptionist or admin person hasn't had any information about how to talk about these things, well, maybe it hasn't even been told what pronouns are, and then it pops up for them rather than later when this person is coming to you. I know there's a lot of access um, barriers for people at that point in the waiting room, at that point in front of the other members of the public being addressed by a name and probably a pro possibly talked about with a pronoun, you know, she's come in to see us about this thing or he's here for a blah blah, that, that, that kind of gendered pronoun stuff can happen in that space. So it's useful to put it in and then that's one of the points that we wanted to make is make sure that your frontline admin staff, your receptionists who are usually doing such amazing work holding that space at the front line of especially in primary care that's my experience of where some really fantastic work happens flip side is it can be really not fantastic work and it's really important so those staff members need access to education information training resources it's not just a clinical staff issue this is something that is relevant to the whole team so ideally if you are a clinician and you have a bit of sway with how things get uh sorted out in terms of who's got access to an education session or access to watching something or participating in a training. We've definitely done workshops specifically for admin and reception staff. And I know that it's been hard for them to get that time. It's been harder for them to get that time with us than it has for other, other people working in the clinic. So keep that in mind if you can advocate for your, for your workmates to get access to that. It could be extremely helpful. Yeah, that um, first first face you see in the door interaction is absolutely where a lot of folks experience barriers to care. So it's not just interacting with clinicians that can be barriers to care. It's also the physical space, um, the kind of tone of the interaction, the, the um, ability to call someone by their correct name and pronouns. Like that is absolutely the, the first place. When we're thinking about barriers to care, that's where it starts. It's not just, I mean, in public health, we think even bigger than that, but in this specific uh, context, yeah, first thing in the door. And that's often the first point of um, interaction with information systems as well, right? Like if you're coming into a practice, you'll be filling in a form and I've heard examples of where someone's filled in a paper form and there's been 
an open field for gender so they can just write down what their gender is or there's been more options but then when it comes to actually putting that into the computer um the admin person is faced with a system where they they don't have the same range of choices so um that's really important that they have the confidence and skills to be able to have a respectful conversation with that person not in front of everybody else in the waiting room but about like look I need to choose between these options which would you prefer that I put you down as um type that's, of thing that's such a good example Moira because that's considered um it's becoming more of like the recommended way of having intake forms is to have an open box for gender but if those digital systems don't account for it it's almost like false advertising like it's leading the patient to think oh they understand gender stuff they let me put gender queer or gender fluid down or you know whatever their term is but then the poor admin is is got two options maybe three that aren't very good like it's it's a trap it's putting people in a situation where they can't win both the people who work in the clinic and the patient and so that transparency fixes all of that right there by being like i want you to be able to identify however you need to identify and also i'm working with this computer system mm. that doesn't have a spot for that so what do we do to make everybody feel the best that they can and make sure you get your needs met i've been in that exact situation where i've filled out you know there's an open box on an enrollment form at primary care and i filled it out probably I wrote non-binary I'm not sure and handed it back to the receptionist and then she looked at it and and was like hmm she let me walk away and then she called me back and wanted to talk about me putting non-binary in that form and 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 I appreciated that like she was trying to say I can't actually put that into my system here but she was having that conversation in front of a lot of other people in the waiting room and I'm someone who is publicly very trans <laughs> so it was not terrible for me i didn't feel like my privacy was being um disrespected in my particular situation but it, i can imagine that would be really terrifying for a lot of people and it was probably uncomfortable for the people who were hearing the conversation because they didn't know what that was about um people get anxious so yeah that kind of problem can come up and can immediately be made into a situation that is a problem for the person who's accessing care. We've got and, some other, oh, you can worry. Oh, I was going to say, and in that situation too, it's that skill of like, how do you acknowledge that it's a problem with the computer, actually? It's not right. a problem with the person, like don't, not making the person feel yeah, as yeah. though Your you're gender a problem doesn't, in some way. <laughs> doesn't make sense, actually. Uh, no, mm. you know, that's unhelpful. And I know we, we were talking about organ inventories and the thing about can this feel invasive? And I appreciate Cassie saying it's not about breaking people into body parts in a really um, bits and pieces of you way. I think of it as being um, very connected to building a picture and a story about a person's health history and information and needs and goals and desires. And usually, um, I think a lot of trans and non-binary people appreciate our embodiment and gender related stuff being put into that bigger picture and an organ inventory may look like a tool that breaks us down into little pieces but i think it actually can fit into a, a story that actually is quite affirming and comes specifically from me like is about me myself and my needs and my goals and that's a really good relationship building process so if you can um yeah have the, the competence and the confidence to calmly talk about these things and to do it framed as um, history and goals and information we need. I really think that's extremely valuable. Okay, we do have other questions um, and I'm trying to decide since we're running close to the end of our time here, which ones to talk about. I'm, somebody was asking about prescriptions and lab orders and dead names, so somebody's legal name, say someone hasn't changed their legal name. Do we know how to prevent somebody's legal name that they no longer use, that is their dead name, popping up on a prescription or on a lab test? I, I don't have all the information about that. I my, In my experience, putting a preferred name into some systems means that that name does come up on my prescriptions. It doesn't, like it supersedes the dead name. And even if that, I haven't legally changed it, I know in some systems, I don't know which ones they are, it is possible for that to take precedence. Yeah, I have a very unsatisfying response to that, which is um, all of these systems are different. And so mm -hmm. not just 
the primary care software is different from the hospital software, but every single different pharmacy entity probably has their own software. And all of those softwares interface with each other in different ways. Like Joey mentioned, not really communicating very well with other systems. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of different combinations of situations patients may find themselves in. Just want to acknowledge that for the clinicians. Like you may have someone who cannot change their name legally because they're an immigrant. You may have someone who needs to have their documents match and so they can't change their name legally and other people don't want to change their name. They want to just be known by their preferred name. Like there's a bunch of different combinations and there's a bunch of different reasons why someone may have um, a legal name that is different from the name that they go by. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, some systems accommodate those yeah. fields that say preferred name really well. And that's the only name you'll, you'll see. But then when that information gets transferred over to a system that doesn't have a preferred name field, yeah. then you end up hearing back from your dead name. So for example, my experience is going to the hospital, I hear my legal name, but when I go to my GP, mm -hmm. I hear Cassie. And so it's like, and, um, yeah, it's, it's, there's not a, a, a one size fits all solution. There's not a recommendation that I can tell you yeah. that's going to fix this problem, but the best way to mitigate those harms is going to be to talking with the patient and understanding what it is that's going on, making sure that they have space in your clinical practice to say things like, yeah, um, I haven't been picking up my medications because when I go to the pharmacy, they call me by my dead name and say, ma'am, or, um, yeah. something along those lines. And so, yeah, being able to know what those barriers to care are that the patient is experiencing in this weird morass of digital infrastructures um, is probably a good first step because then you can say, okay, well then what do we need to do? Can we change your name here? Do we have a way forward? Is there something mm. we can do to mitigate this? Um, and have that be a conversation. And we do spend a lot of time usually in these webinars acknowledging the problems and saying that we appreciate that a lot of people who come voluntarily to our sessions are probably the same people who are working in champion, champion, championing our cause. You know, they are, you are quite likely the people who know that these barriers exist and we invite you to really work with us and work with other people, work with Te Whatu Order, or to make complaints about the system if it's not working, or to see what you can progress from your um, clinic and sort of up the chain. And if there's a way we can support that, we absolutely would at Tingaku Kahukura to try and get. I, I know there are people working on HERA and and a national system that will be an, an improvement, but there will always still be older systems in use as well. And I'm sure the new one won't be perfect. So we will still need you to be doing that advocacy, uh, which I know is a lot for us to be asking, but it's really a necessary thing for our health system to become more functional, which really would benefit anyone working in health as well as people accessing healthcare. And we do care about that from both sides of that angle. We've had some great um, compliments and, and reflections in the chat. So Cassie, definitely what you're sharing is really helpful for people. Thank you for doing that. Um, in terms of lab testing and that kind of whole field, we are in conversation with someone about coming to do a webinar with us at some point, probably in July, uncertain date, date to be determined. Um, and we'll get in touch with everyone on our email list, which you can sign up to on our website about when that's going to happen. So if you're interested in exploring more about lab tests and issues that, that are related to this that are coming up in that space in particular, um, sign up to our updates. We have an evaluation form as well. So if you just want to repeat some of those compliments in the evaluation form, that would be so great. We'll try and copy this chat so that we still have them. But any, any information you can give us about this being useful to you or not useful to you is not only going to help us doing webinars in the future, but also helps us justify when we need to apply for some funding to run a particular project. You know, often our webinars, we're not getting a particular funding stream to do them, um, but we are funded to provide publicly available resources. So yeah, we do sometimes really need that evaluation information. It's really helpful to us. Maybe we're at the point where we're gonna share our last thoughts um, from Moira and Cassie. I'm thinking 
particularly oh no there's one more question i want us to try and answer okay i'm real quick emergency departments this is an area that just keeps coming up in our in our webinars i was saying please be careful about in a crowded reception area how you talk about people and what information you're asking us in an emergency department, the reception is very public, often very crowded. Do we have any suggestions for how to manage that in relation to gender and trans people, non-binary people, et cetera, in an emergency department context? I'm not saying we know everything about this. Do we feel like it's really about the same principles applying again? I'm really torn on this because in an emergent situation, um, the emergency room, it is such a complicated place for trans folks because yeah. we know that a lot of people who prolong going to routine care are more likely to end up in ED and trans people have a lot of barriers to routine care, which means we're more likely to end up in ED. Um, it also is one of those situations, like you said, it's very public. There's lots of people around and people can be under quite a lot of stress, both the people working and the people who are seeking care. Um, one thing I will just put on the record is probably um, the phenomenon known as trans broken arm syndrome um, that plays out in emergency care quite a lot where people think that someone's experiences of transness or the fact that they have um, they're on hormones they're medically transitioning is somehow relevant to whatever the emergency situation is. And um, as someone who is not a clinician, I don't think there's too many situations in which my transness is going to be an emergency um, situation. And so uh, I'm not going to say that it's not relevant in that right, context, right, right. but it's um, not likely the reason that someone is seeking care in that mm. situation. It may be part of why they have gotten to that point, is those barriers to care way back. But ultimately, someone being transgender, being on hormones is probably not the reason that they're actually seeking those emer emergency services. So trying to navigate that very awkward, stressful situation mm. with that in mind is probably the first step. And like gender neutral language as much as possible is the thing that occurs to me, yeah. you know, especially if you just can't have that conversation for various reasons about someone's pronouns or preferred name or what they call the different parts of their body because it's an emergency situation and things are moving faster than that. Um, it's okay, you can adapt if people give you that information later, which hopefully they get an opportunity to give you that information later. And as you can, as much as possible, um, refrain from really going hard out in the direction of she and lady and ma'am, or like he and um, man things, then that will probably help because you're not necessarily gendering the person and saying, oh, they're a non-binary, but you are holding a space for just not having enough information yet to, to make a call and mm. that you can't really know until someone can talk to you about it. Someone also said in the chat, you could have a small room to talk to people about these things. That's a great idea if it's possible. And when you are, Joey mentioned, when someone does disclose that information, it's kind of like holding a little bit of space, breathing room so that person yep. can say that thing and then receiving it well, because it's it's no slight against you being corrected. Yeah. Being wrong is not being bad. Like being able to hold those feelings and be like, oh yeah, thank you for letting me know. Thank you mm -hmm. for trusting me enough to disclose that information to me and then going forward accordingly. Like that's, yeah. that's also building trust with them in that situation and building trust with the whole healthcare system with mm -hmm. that patient. Like they will think next time, maybe someone will be more receptive to me telling them who yeah. I am. Yeah. Mm. And some of the, yeah, gender neutral language stuff is around like this patient or this yeah. person instead of he or she, right? I was thinking of a situation I was in once, which was not a medical thing, but where somebody talked about, you know, this person needs some help with this thing. And it, mm. yeah, that felt really, mm. a really respectful way of dealing with it. Yeah. And it can feel awkward because you haven't practiced it, but once you've done it a few times, it'll get easier and easier. I know we're at time and we need to wrap this up and thank everyone for being here. It's been a great conversation and I've really appreciated how active everyone's been in the chat as well. And we will put links to various resources um, on our website and get in touch with us if you have follow-up questions that we haven't answered. Um, maybe we need to do another session with Cassie. No, maybe, we wouldn't be opposed. <laughs> Moira, will you close us with Karakia since we opened that way? 
Yeah, of course. Thanks, Joey. And thanks so much, Cassie, for being with us today. Um, I wanted to also just, before I close with Karikia, just also share our website again and say, go and check out our webinars. Um, you'll be able to find the recording of um, this one from later on this afternoon, but there's a whole bunch of other ones you can go and watch as well. And we've got a suggestion box up there now as well. So if today has sparked any thoughts about what we should talk to a bit, talk to Cassie about next time or somebody else we should um, bring on or other topics that you'd like to learn more about, um, please do share them there as well. Um, and thank you all for taking time to be here today. It's um, been great to see your questions and reflections and, and compliments and thoughts um, through the chat as well. But I'll just close this with karakia and let you get on with your afternoon. Um, me karakia tato. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapunui, kia wātia, kia māma, te ngākau, te tinana, te wairua i te ara takata. Koe ara i rongo whakaere ake ki runga, kia tīna, tīna, uie, tāekia. Kia ora. Thank you very much.